All right, so I want to start. I'm young, or maybe not that young, not me, you. But uh, I want to start selling online, right? I got a product. I think people want to buy it. Great. I got the website. I got the suppliers. I got maybe the logistics. But what's it going to cost me, and what are my options, right? So, Martin, what's it going to cost me, and what are my options? And what are my options, whether I'm in Jordan or Egypt or UAE? So I want to sell stuff online. How do I do it? And what's it going to cost me? Um. Well, what are your options? Um, credit card is, of course, one of the options that uh, you have to consider. However, if we see from our, what, what we see from Cashew is that credit card still only makes up around 50% of the, uh, the transactions. Five zero. Which means that you will have, if you only accept credit cards, you will have 50% uh, of your potential buyers out there who wants to buy from you, but they can't buy. So you need to provide them with some kind of alternative payment method. And that's uh, really where we come in, because we, we, we give you the platform which gives you the, uh, the credit cards, but also the alternative payment method. And even if someone is has a credit card and it might be rejected for whatever reasons, we can present you with uh, the alternative payment at, at the pay on the payment page. Now, what is it going to cost you? That's a good question. Uh, it, it, it all depends on which payment method you're selecting and, and also in which country you are, are operating because uh, I'm not going to go in on the, on the credit card fees. I think uh, Stephen can take those. But if you look at, I mean, the alternative payment methods such as Cashew, we're talking about uh, fees around uh, three, four uh, percent. If you took look at uh, direct debits, they vary from. Uh, they're normally priced in fixed price per transaction, which means that you're paying not a percentage but a fixed price, and they vary from country to country depending on uh, the what should I say the the financial infrastructure of the country. But if you look at a country like, like UAE, for example, uh, you're talking about a transaction fee around 10 dirhams. Uh, in uh, Lebanon, maybe uh, uh, four, $4. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to say because we're talking about pan, pan, pan region here. Thanks. And uh, I mean, that's, that's the, the question. And thanks actually for being, you know, I know it's difficult regionally, but just being like transparent in terms of cost and things. But let's continue the cost theme. So, Paulo, I want to set up I'm in the UE, Network International, Acquirer. What's it going to cost me? Let's start with cost first, then we'll, we'll talk about it. What's it going to cost me? Um, so, again, the cost conversation is not an easy one to have. It needs to understand in terms of the size, volume, your business case, et cetera, your risk profile, um, the countries in which you want to offer the product, because each one will have a different risk profile. So we've got a schedule uh, which is very easy to understand. So you come in, have a chat, and look at the uh, setup cost plus the per transaction fee, which will sometimes be a flat fee plus a percentage of the actual transaction. And that's very easy to understand. And that goes around your particular business case, your expected volume, and the potential risk profile of the countries in which you're trying to offer your service. So. Network International is going to cost you about 3% plus some other associated fees and things. But again, it, it depends. But most people are paying like 3% plus fixed fees. So disclosure, I'm a customer of Network International. Happy to talk about that. But Ronaldo, what's it going to cost for me to sell on Souk? So you guys are enabling platform. What's it going to cost me to sell my product? So in general, we, our ROI is unless you sell, we won't charge you. And a transaction fee would be around 5% of the value of the sale plus about a dollar, dollar and a half to manage the logistics to get you an error bill to ship your item and manage your payment for you. So it's pretty low cost. We believe in volumes. Zero. What, is it, like, what should we be expecting? So what, is the, what does the Western world look like in terms of payments online? What's, what are people paying in Europe that you transact online? So, well, today we have a privileged situation in Europe. And we have a privileged situation in some countries like France, where the Visa MasterCard penetration is more, almost 100%. So I think the benchmark is quite different. But um, I, I think overall, if I look back 15, 16 years ago, when e-commerce started back in Europe, um, we already had a great Visa MasterCard uh, credit card penetration. But still, 
people were not ready to pay online because they were full of anxiety and fear that maybe somebody would steal their credit card number and would hack their bank account and would make some purchase in, in, at their place. So I think it's not only the payment device penetration that makes the market exist, but that's also the usage and the way that you and me can accept to pay online. And the, the big luck we had to a certain extent in Europe is that uh, there's been a huge offering development in the late 90s. There's been a lot of e-commerce website developing, flourishing everywhere because there was a lot of inv money, VC money invested in those projects. The reality is that those e-commerce platforms didn't sell anything. I mean, usage were not ready. People were not ready to purchase online. But the marketing expenses of those e-commerce platforms make people realize that there was something very cool happening online and very... Uh, easy to handle, which was online purchase and online commerce. So I think that for the market to develop, you need, of course, payment devices. And uh, from what I've learned in the past days, obviously in the region, cash on delivery is at least a solution, but it's not ideal. But at least you have a solution. So you cannot expect all the market to change at once. You cannot expect all the usage to change at once. People will pay online, people will be equipped by payment devices like um, electronic cards or physical banking cards in, in, in the time. Whether it's going to take five years or ten years, nobody knows. But for it to happen, you need to have more offering, more e-commerce website that brings some value to the user so that users realize that they have a true value to get something online. And from what I've listened and what I've seen in the last uh, weeks and the last days here is that there's a lot of initiative, there's a lot of e-commerce platform coming, but maybe not enough for users to realize that they have a key value to grab online and to convince them to make online purchases. So I think the main thing is we need more initiative, we need more e-commerce platform to flourish, different name. Souk is one famous brand here. We need other famous brands, maybe uh, brands coming from the States, coming from Asia, coming from India, coming from uh, Europe that invest in marketing, that invest to get users to realize that something is happening online. And this is education of online behavior that can make the e-commerce flourish. Payment solution is important, but even if payment solution like um, Cashew or Aramex or, uh, interna or International Network are said to be expensive, at least they exist and they can deliver a good and they can deliver a product. So, which is to start what we need. So I think two questions that I heard a lot yesterday are two points of conversation. So we'll start with one of them first, which is, and I saw a few questions up too, is that a lot of people don't even know where to get a payment processor. So you start a business in Egypt, you start a business in Lebanon, you start a business in Jordan, and it's really difficult to actually find out who you can use to actually, you know, help you take payments online, and then what the criteria are to be like a seller. So I guess what I'd like to understand from the payment providers is that you know, what is like the basic criteria for you to accept someone as like a seller or to accept someone as a PSP customer or accept someone as a cashew customer? So, Ronaldo, you guys enable platform. So, why, why would you not have someone as a seller? What's like that basic criteria from a seller? Is it volume? Is it, is it what is it? From a so, we're an open platform. So, as long as you have the products that you're selling and the products are legal in the market that you're trying to promote them and sell them, will enable you to basically sell online in the market. So our barrier to entry is very low, and there's no really setup cost in terms of, but when your volume starts going up, you naturally will get promoted more on the platform, you'll get a better pie of the business. So literally, if I have like, if I make like one particular product, I have like 10 or 20 of them or whatever, I can sell through Souk, right? There's no minimum barrier, right? Okay. Martin, same thing, like who do you accept? Who do you turn away? Like who isn't qualified as a cashew customer? Uh, same criteria as, as uh, Ron, Ronaldo is saying. I mean, we don't discriminate anyone really, except uh, they need to be complying with uh, what we can consider moral uh, or ethical rules when it comes to the product they're selling. But we dis don't discriminate on, on uh, if, if it's a startup, if they have a track record with a bank or uh, nationality or, or anything like that. So it's, it's it's exactly the same as Ronaldo. It's, it's purely on the, uh, the ethics of the, uh, the, the services or the product they're selling. So, Paul, I'm going to ask you the same question, but just as a bit of a preface. So, 
I guess Network International is a bit notorious for being a bit of a black box. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a few people that have probably dealt with, so it's a bit difficult to reach, not too sure why I get a merchant account or not, not too sure what it costs, the costs are really a bit different, there's like high fees and whatever, so I guess like, if you can help us get some insight, because I know a lot of people have a lot of challenges with Network International, I know you're fairly recently there, but, you know, can you give us some insight in terms of, you know, I'm sure that still B2C e-commerce is a tiny percentage probably of Network International's overall business, which fair enough, right, but it's growing, but, you know, who gets a merchant account, who doesn't? What's the general kind of things you look at as a business? What are big red flags that, you know, those are businesses that don't end up as a network international customer? So how does that look from the inside? Uh, well, thanks for the question. I mean, I think if there are any, uh, any other questions you'd like to ask about the organization, you're very welcome to. I mean, what we try and be is as transparent as possible with regards to all our products, all our services. And, you know, we're delighted to chat to anybody about uh, offering a particular service to them. So I think from that point of view, if you've had any issues, you're very welcome to come and have a chat to me during the course of today. With regards to e-commerce, I mean, obviously we are a provider of a number of platforms within Network International. The way that it will work is that you would approach the organization either through myself or through one of our sales folk. You'd sign up for a particular session. We'll go through again what I mentioned before, key things to see your business plan the potential volume, financials that you're projecting, also the countries in which you uh, are going to be offering your particular product. Um, and then again, I think, you know, fees are relative. I mean, one's perception may be that they are particularly high. Also need to understand the services we provide in, f in terms of the fraud monitoring, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the risk and all the logistics that we need to provide. So again, uh, when we go through the particular pricing structure, we'll explain all of that to the individuals. So the value-added services that we particularly provide to a merchant is obviously very important. It's not just a question of fulfilling a payment, but it's the end-to-end -end value chain of what's in that payment, the risk profile, the fraud monitoring, and all the other value-added services that you'd want from a payments gateway. Um, so hopefully that clarifies.